and welcome to another episode of Getting to Know the Dead, and I am your host, Deadbug. Why, thank you. And this here is a sneak peek of a podcast that you get every week over on Patreon. And what is Patreon, you might be asking me? Well, my addle-minded friend, Patreon is a subscription-based service. Where as low as a buck, you get access to a lot of cool things. Podcasts, exclusive content, early releases, uncensored joints, music downloads, live Q&As. Does this excite you? Think about it! And there's a thriving community there with a lot of tasty women, if you don't mind me saying. And I ain't asking. Nice. Does it not stagger the imagination? Uh Uh-huh. And dudes, if you're into that. Which I know some of you are, but I don't judge. Anyways, I'll leave a link in the description and you can go check it out. Because what else can you get for a buck? Well, you could probably get a retard to mow your lawn, but I guarantee you he wouldn't do a good job. And he'll probably have no legs and one arm and he'll make you feel bad about things when you complain he didn't do the hedges properly. That's so offensive. Ah, get out of here, you half a sissy before I smack you. Besides, some people don't take pride in their garden. And all my podcasts over on Patreon can be downloaded as MP3 straight to your phone. Just in case some of you guys have a mental handicap or a disability, you might want to listen to them over and over again because you didn't get it the first time. So sign up, and I'll see you over there. Now this week, boys and girls, is True Crime Week. Welcome to a Dead Bug Murder Incorporated podcast. And this podcast is part two of Blood Relatives, the story of Fritz Klinner and Susie Newsom. A tale of murder incest and intrigue in America's deep south. So if you haven't heard part one, go back and listen to it or you'll be wasting my fucking time as well as yours. Pride, madness, murder, just a little bit of incest. (laughs) Well, a lot actually, if you can measure that sort of thing. Two wealthy southern families connected by marriage and torn apart by a bit of divorce and a custody battle. In the previous episode, we explored two first cousins, Susie Sharp and Fritz Klenner, two very different temperaments and personalities who found each other for whatever reason. Susie Sharp, spoiled, privileged, popular, who could have anything that she wanted and it wasn't enough. When she met tall, handsome basketball star Tom Lynch in university, she was the envy of every woman on campus. Two kids later, a dental practice, living in New Mexico. She figured she'd been shortchanged in life, and she wanted out, divorcing Tom and going back to her parents. And she was hardly mother of the year with a history of abusing her own children, physically beating them, sending them to the hospital several times. When she found out Tom had taken up with his dental assistant, well, she was gonna make him pay and pay not only financially, but using the kids, as she often did to anybody who got in her way. She made it very difficult for Tom to see his two young boys. Fritz Klenner, on the other hand, Susie's first cousin, (laughs) he was a fucking loser. Even Susie avoided him growing up because he made her feel uncomfortable. Which isn't much of a surprise, as a teenager worshipping Hitler, even growing the mustache, who had an unhealthy obsession believing the communist invasion of the US was imminent. There wasn't much to admire. The fact that he worshipped his father, who was a well-known doctor, in itself seemed a borderline on an unhealthy obsession. Not only for young Fritz, but also for his father's patients, wearing a doctor's coat with a stethoscope and following his father around on his daily rounds, withdrawing blood, making diagnoses. And when he flunked out of medical school, and told his father that he passed, and he were able to practice as a doctor, I guess some would say he was taking it all too far. It was when the now adult Susie reacquainted with her cousin Fritz after bumping into each other at his father's medical practice that they seemed to connect. When I say connect, yeah, I mean they started fucking each other against Susie's parents' wishes. And that disapproval led to her moving out and taking their beloved grandchildren with her. And although Tom was only sporadically able to see his two young boys, He was able to figure out that something wasn't right in the household. 
especially when the boys told him that their mother was now living with the Uncle Fritz. But there wasn't much Tom could do, and it was on one of those visits that Tom received the phone call from the police and found out that his mother and his beloved sister had been murdered. And this is where we begin part two of Blood Relatives. The death of Tom's mother and beloved sister had left him in a state of shock. After all, it was only a year earlier that he'd lost his father to cancer, and now he had no one. Appreciating the bond of family even more, and needing his sons close by his side, he phoned his ex-wife and asked if the kids could stay a little longer. Susie refused. The death of Tom's mother and his sister meant that he was the sole heir to the family fortune and would be inheriting millions. So the police were keen to talk to him and find out if he had an alibi. And he offered no resistance. After all, he was as clean as a soul on a cripple's boot. Meaning the mint julep sipping cops didn't have a goddamn clue. And it was one weeks turned into months. The only thing the cops could say for sure is it looked like the killing had been a professional hit using a high-powered automatic rifle and that no bullets were left at the scene and it had been staged to make it look like there'd been a robbery with jewelry boxes overturned, wallets taken while other valuable items were left in plain sight. Several leads were investigated but the cops didn't have a clue who killed Dolores and Janie Lynch. After his mother and his sister's tragic death, Tom received a card and a letter from his ex-mother-in-law, Florence Newsom. In the letter, she sent Tom her condolences. Tom responded to that letter and told Florence that he wanted to see his two children more and that he only wanted what any father would want who loved his children. The mother-in-law, who had had her own well-documented problems with her daughter, wrote back to Tom and said she had agreed that all her and her husband desired was that Tom have a strong bond with his sons, something that the boys needed to grow up to be healthy individuals in society. With this, Tom saw it as a positive correspondence and hopefully in the future, his mother-in-law might be able to help him get access to his two sons. As it seemed, his in-laws, just like himself, only wanted the best for the two children. Through this correspondence, it was agreed that Florence and her husband Bob would testify at the custody battle to say that they thought Tom should be able to see his sons more, as well as access through telephone conversations and letter writing. And they were asking the judge to petition Susie to give those rights, even though this would most certainly go against their daughter Susie's wishes. And it did, when she found out she was furious and saw what her parents had done as a blatant betrayal. And she told the judge that she believed now more than ever, as per what Fritz said, that her ex-husband was involved in Mexican drug cartels, and that explained why his mother and his sister had been whacked. And her beliefs were on good authority because her cousin had been in the CIA. The custody hearing had been scheduled for May 26, 1985. It was a week before that hearing that no one had heard from Bob or Florence Newsom. Their last known whereabouts was when they went to visit Bob's 85-year-old mother and they'd not returned home after that weekend visit. Hattie Newsom had been Susie's favorite grandmother and they'd been very close, but she was one of many family members that Susie ended up alienating after she took up with Fritz Klenner. When various people attempted to call Hattie's home and no one answered, a neighbor was called, who was also Hattie's family doctor, who went over to her house to investigate. The first thing the family doctor noticed was the back window was broken. He also saw that Bob and Florence's car, along with Hattie's, was still parked in the driveway. And as he was now cautiously approaching the house, he could see that the back door to the living room was left open. 
Without entering, he witnessed Hattie Newsom laying on the floor with her face shot off. And Florence lie beside her, looking much less the same. The doctor ran to call 911, telling him it looked like a retard had been playing pin the tail on the donkey with a chainsaw. When cops arrived and started poking around, they could see that Hattie had been sitting in an easy chair, unawares of her impending doom. Shot once in the gut, and then twice in the head. She was spun around like a children's top. And it looked like Bob had been sitting on the couch, and the first couple of bullets had missed him. And he ran for his life towards the kitchen, before three bullets in the back took him down. The kill shot me into the face, and he was on his knees begging when he succumbed. And Florence, I guess they saved the best for last. What police considered overkill. The first bullet was right to the heart, and what would have been considered in itself fatal. The second shot was close range in the face. Stabbed multiple times in the chest with a large hunting knife. Three times in the neck, then her throat were cut ear to ear where her spine was almost severed while still holding a glass of iced tea. The detectives figured with a more detailed analysis that it were a robbery gone wrong. Or maybe what someone wanted them to believe were a robbery gone wrong. Because although there were belongings taken, there were much more valuable things left out in the open that could have been taken. Including a valuable diamond necklace and $500 worth of cash in a jar by the front door. They took Florence's engagement ring. And they also tried to cut off her wedding band. And it was all bent up, so they left it behind. When Florence and Bob's oldest son, Rob, arrived, well, he was in a state of shock. Why would anyone want to kill his beloved parents? But he told detectives that it was almost a year to the day that his sister's ex-husband's parents were murdered brutally. The next day, when cops told Susie Newsom that her mother and father and her dear grandmother were dead, it didn't seem to affect her. She didn't even seem shocked. And all she said was, well, there's nothing left now. And they didn't know what she meant, but they were struck at how cold she took it. She seemed more concerned that one of her dogs had gone missing that morning and needed to go out and look for it. She told the officers that she didn't need them to come over because her dear Fritz was with her, and then she hung up. When Tom Lynch found out about his ex-in-law's murders, he was in shock. And he phoned Susie to try to give his condolences. After all, his children had lost their grandparents. And now they'd lost a second set. But Susie didn't want to talk to him. So he phoned her brother, Rob. When he heard the details, and how the killings were almost execution style, like his own parents. Well, Tom knew something didn't smell right in North Carolina. And it weren't that stinky Nazi-loving jizz that Fritz was spraying in his cousin. Because on the eve of a parent's testimony against their own daughter, they would have given Tom equal rights to see his children. And they end up squished and sprayed all over a living room wall. Nah, something weren't right. So Tom called Detective Ellen Gentry, the detective handling the investigation of his mother and his sister's murder. After all, both the Newsom and the Lynches were prominent citizens, and the cases were given high priority. And they were in all the papers, and the heat coming down on the detectives were making them more than just a little uncomfortable. When Gentry called Susie to interview her about her parents and her grandmother's demise, Susie says she was too busy to talk which many might consider bizarre behavior. How could you be too busy to help catch your parents' killers? But she agreed to meet with him the next day. And when Detective Gentry told Lynch that he'd be meeting with his ex-wife, Tom told the detective that he should be looking into Fritz Klenner, who was his ex-wife's first cousin, and he believed they were more than just kissing cousins. A nutty, Nazi-loving survivalist 
who had more than a passing interest in firearms. It was then that Detective Gentry had more than just a hunch. The next day, the detective spoke to Susie's brother, Rob, and asked him if he knew anybody in the family who were into firearms. It was then that Rob mentioned Fritz Klenner, and it was the second time Gentry had heard that name. It was during his poking around that he came across a friend of Fritz's named Ian Perkins, a 21-year-old college student who had idolized Fritz since he was a boy, and they had both had a significant interest in weapons. Klina had also impressed the younger man that he was a CIA agent, and since it was Perkins' dream to work as a government operative, well, he were bending over and Fritz were giving it to him. Dry, and he was liking it. Perkins went on to tell the detective that Fritz had enlisted his help and that he was on a mission to kill drug traffickers and that he had a covert assignment for the young man, an audition if you will, and that if he completed the task, Fritz would consider him for future missions. And Perkins started chewing on the shit sandwich that Fritz was serving him. And by all accounts, he was liking it. What happened next is in a direct account by Perkins to the detective. Fritz needed Perkins on the weekend of May 17th to the 19th to drive him to the area of Winston and Salem. Fritz was dropped off at precisely 8 o'clock p.m. in a wooded area, less than half a mile from where Hattie Newsom's place was. He then instructed Perkins to pick him up at exactly midnight. Fritz told Perkins that if he was ever questioned about where they were that evening, to say that they were in the Virginia mountains, camping. Although when questioned by detectives, Perkins started singing like a retard with a Mr. Microphone on Christmas morning. And that's when detectives informed Jenkins that not only was Fritz not an agent, he wasn't even a doctor, but was a suspect in five homicides. And this is when Jenkins agreed to wear a wire and meet up with his amigo, Fritz. Because detectives knew that Fritz Klenner was a well-known bragger, and they were hoping to get him on tape, spilling the beans and admitting to the murders. It was on June 1st and 2nd that Perkins, now wired, met with Fritz. On tape, it can clearly be heard that Perkins was as nervous as a schoolgirl about to get her cherry popped. And he kept talking, more than Fritz were, and wouldn't let him get a word in edgewise. But when he did, Klenner stick to his story about being a CIA operative, and didn't break or give anything away. Seems he was smarter than detectives thought. With nothing on tape yet, detectives sent Perkins out for a third time on June the 3rd. Perkins sat with Fritz in his black Chevy Blazer, and detectives laughed uncomfortably, noticing that Klenner's bumper sticker said, Don't get mad, get even. Perkins, terrified he was going to get caught and get his own face blown off, told Fritz that he was being questioned about the noose of murders, and asked him if he knew anything about him. It was then that Fritz made the closest he did to a confession without actually confessing. He told Jenkins that he'd write a letter to the police, telling him that he had nothing to do with the murders. And then he told him that he had some business to take care of, and that they wouldn't be seeing each other again. Several unmarked cop cars were now following both Perkins and Fritz. After Fritz dropped the Perkins off on a street corner, he drove over to his and Susie's place. At this point, after relaying the contents of the tape to the district attorney, they were given permission to arrest Fritz. But as they were about to make the arrest, Fritz and Susie came out and started loading what appeared to be camping equipment into the Chevy Blazer. But cops were shocked to see the two young boys with them. They'd assumed that Jim and John weren't with the couple, as it was a school day. And this changed everything. There were four separate county police forces involved in the surveillance, all surrounding the house in the immediate area, ready to move in guns a blazing. And now kids were involved. With Fritz behind the wheel, the black blazer drove east down the road and headed towards traffic lights. 
when one of the detective's vehicles who hadn't heard the message to stand down pulled up in front of the Chevy Blazer attempting to block Fritz. Once the cover was blown, officers on foot stormed Fritz's vehicle with their weapons drawn. But I guess all those years expecting the commie horde to arrive, Fritz were wise to it, and he drove his truck up onto the grass and curb and spun away. As Fritz sped away at speeds up to 80 miles an hour, it was now considered a high-speed pursuit, with over 20 vehicles chasing him. It was during this pursuit that one of the police cars rammed the passenger side with Fritz in it. When the officer looked up, he saw Fritz, less than nine feet away, with a smile on his face, pointing a nine millimeter submachine gun at him, to which he started spraying the officer. The officer wearing a bulletproof vest was struck several times, including twice in the chest and once in a belt buckle that saved his life. The officer, whose wife always nagged him to wear a bulletproof vest, was glad that he listened that day. Now in the middle of the day, in a crowded intersection, bullets were flying, and it was a wild west between cops and Fritz the Nazi. But cops were no match for submachine gun, and while they were ducking, Fritz and his family got away. And as the cars chased Fritz, he suddenly did a U-turn and stopped and got out of his car and started firing at the unmarked police officers. Officers jumped from the vehicles and ran for cover. No match for a submachine gun. Then Fritz casually got back into his blazer and started driving away again. This time, cops kept a healthy distance behind the Nazi sympathizer. Officers who had been told to stand down and not to attempt to approach the vehicle Recall Fritz looking out and smiling at them as he sped by. With the malpractice miscreant randomly stopping and spraying officers. But as the blazer approached the main highway, eerily, it began to slow down. With its brake lights coming on, with all pursuing officers screeching to a halt behind them, the officers jumped from the vehicles taking cover, anticipating Fritz's next flourish of cyanide-coated lead. But before they could even ready their weapons, they saw a flame coming out from underneath Fritz's vehicle, and then an explosion. The explosion was so intense that it lifted the Chevy Blazer higher than the telephone poles before it landed back to the ground. It was 3.07 p.m. June 3rd, 1985. A voice could be heard over the police intercom saying he blew the whole goddamn thing up. And as officers stormed the vehicle, they found Fritz laying 100 feet from the explosion, still breathing, face down. And they turned him over, hoping to get a confession from the Nazi-loving fucker. The last thing he did was gurgle, and he drowned on his own blood. They were dead. And on the other side of the road, they found Susie Newsom's head. Which I think is kind of ironic, considering she always thought she was such a piece of ass. She'd been sitting on top of the bomb in the passenger seat when it went off, and shredded her into almost nothingness, with them only finding her hands. And in the wreckage, they found the bodies of Susie's two young boys still strapped into the back seat. It was later determined that they had both been given cyanide and then shot in the head. Forensics determined by the trajectory of the bullets that it was Susie who put her sons down. It was only minutes after the explosion that the heavens opened up rain golf ball sized hailstones down on the wreckage, washing away most of the forensic evidence. Emergency workers said they'd never seen a storm with such intensity, or almost like Fritz the Nazi lover had fucked off God, and he was showing it to the world. Police had never been able to establish what part Susie played in those murders, but figured it were pretty convenient that these were her enemies that were laid to waste. By all witness accounts, she showed no remorse. And a lot of those who still defend Susie say that she was brainwashed by a malpracticing neo-Nazi madman. But at the end of the day, few people can argue that she was a fucking bitch. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast, boys and girls. And this is Dead Bug saying, good night, sleep tight.
Don't let the bed bugs bite. This has been an episode of Murder Incorporated, a dead bug podcast. Now, if you like this sort of thing, come on over to Patreon. I left the link in the description. Early releases, podcasts, music downloads, it's all there. Link is in the description. I'll see you over there. This is Deadbug. Saying adios.